Thanks for the invitation to be able to speak today as part of this seminar, uh, organising for 21st century socialism. Any seminar trying to deal with this, this issue could do no wrong in trying to deal with the issues that are going on in Latin America today. So that's really going to be the focus of my talk today. I want to try and draw out three key issues that the left in Latin America has had to either deal with or at least raise as, as strategic questions. Who is the revolutionary subject? A question of class. How or should we even take power? A question of the state. And what kind of political organisation do we need? Uh, the question of party or, as the title refers to, the question of uh, revolutionary leadership. These are three strategic questions facing all of us in the left around the world, but we have a, perhaps the advantage of the fact that in Latin America, over the last two decades, we've seen a very profound process of struggle, one that's begun to change the nature um, of, of Latin America, and I think there are therefore some lessons that we can learn from there. Firstly, there are definitely lessons but no models to be learnt from in Latin America. If people are expecting to find some, some blueprint for how we can repeat all this stuff elsewhere, it's certainly not going to be found, neither in Latin America, not in the talk today. I think there's a number of reasons why Latin America uh, provides us with such a window of opportunity to try and learn uh, from yeah, what is essentially a mass laboratory uh, for, for experimenting with radical change. Latin America was the first and hardest hit by neoliberalism, and by neoliberalism I'm not just referring to a, a set of economic policies, rather I'm referring to neoliberalism understood as a class project, an attempt to reassert the power of capital internationally, and one that, a project that was carried out, or is being carried out, under the aegis of the US imperial state. Latin America was chosen as the first region to implement it, and it was where it was implemented most harshly, perhaps the most famously, in the case of Chile with the Pinochet regime. But it also most drastically reveals the impact that, these, that neo, the neoliberal project had for left and working class forces um, in Latin America. And it brings up some of the characteristics of the resistance that we're now seeing uh, to, to neoliberalism. I think Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa was not wrong when he said that the Indignado movement really began not in Spain or in Europe or in the Arab Spring, but really sometime in the late 80s, early 90s in, in Latin America. I think that points to a second important issue, that this movement of the indignados or this revolt of the 99%, um, the Arab Spring, all of these projects, uh, processes that have been occurring, Latin America continues to be the region where these movements have not only been able to uh, begin to halt and roll back um, the neoliberal project, but also the only region where at least the vision, and we can debate about how much of that vision has become a reality, but at the very minimum, a vision of an alternative, one that's taken the form of 21st century socialism uh, has begun. And so I think in that sense, again, Latin America is important as a re an area for the rebirth of, of socialism, an area where you know, socialism is not just a nice idea, but is an idea and that has captured the imaginations of millions um, across the continent who are fighting to try and at least lay down the foundations for a transition to socialism. And I think given that this advanced level of struggle, which predates the, the current global struggle against austerity, the Europe-wide austerity, the Arab Spring, we've seen this emergence of this new socialist project that has really raised some strategic issues and challenges uh, which the left as a whole um, can learn from as they've begun to tackle this. Having laid out that framework, I wanted to start by looking at how did we get to where we are in Latin America before then returning to address those three key issues the left are facing today. Brazilian uh, economist or political commentator Emir Sada, um, in his recent book, uh, looking at Latin America, um, puts forward a very provocative argument. And he says that so profound was the devastation wracked by neoliberalism on traditional worker and peasant base of the left and socialist forces in Latin America, and I suppose you could add internationally, that the best we can hope for today is simply just placing socialism on the agenda while prioritising the construction of conditions um, and governments capable of dismantling ne neoliberalism, even if it means accepting the broader capitalist system for now. And one doesn't have to agree with his conclusion to at least acknowledge the premise of where he's coming from, and that is the important um, defeats or blows that worker and peasant forces uh, have faced that were inflicted in Latin America in the 80s and 90s. There's much debate about what exactly is neoliberalism, globalisation, the process of restructuring of, of global capitalism, but I think what we can identify is four key facets of neoliberalism and what its impacts and how they relate to, to Latin America. The first is, I've already mentioned, the debilitating or smashing of the traditional base of left and working class forces. And take, for example, Bolivia, where historically the miners have represented the backbone of the struggle for, for radical change and struggle for socialism. Within the period of just two years, 
in the mid 80s, and 35,000 miners were lost, lost their jobs as a process of privatisation and forcing these people out of the mining sector, um, and most of which went into the informal sector, which in a very short period of time grew to being representing 70% of Bolivia's um, workforce. In Venezuela, in one year alone, in 1992, 100,000 industrial workers lost their job just in one year. And Venezuela's never been known for having a very large industrial base, so you can imagine how much that represented of the overall uh, workforce. But the same thing happened in, play, in country after country, where the, where the formal sector was decimated and where even those that remained within the formal sector faced a combination of policies aimed at, lab, at labour flexibilisation, contract work, at smaller production units, where it became much more harder to organise the collective power uh, of these workers. In many cases, the informal workers grew to become the majority of, of, the, um, of the, um, the workforce. Combined with this was the important loss of um, wealth of, of the poorer sectors. And again, just to use Venezuela as a, a clear example, real wages in Venezuela from 1978 to 1999 went down from over $5,000 to $2,000 per month. And that was the example of just how much um, the, the, this process of restructuring the workforce wasn't just done to make productivity increase, but it was very much to uh, reap this wealth away from our working class forces. But as I mentioned, it's only one of four other impacts. The second has to do with the privatisation of the national economy. And I think this one very much goes hand in hand with the dismantling of the state. And what we saw was that much of the key resources, key sectors of the economy in these countries were privatised. And it wasn't just a question of selling off national companies uh, to, to uh, the biggest bidder, uh, those that, well, <laughs> the lowest bidder in many cases actually is probably a more accurate term, um, but it was the actual case of the entire economy being handed over uh, to transnational corporations. What this meant was, of course, for instance, in Bolivia, uh, the funding that came in from royalties from gas dramatically reduced um, to a point where, you know, essentially the, the government was handing over money to the gas transnationals. And in order to fill state coffers, they became more and more dependent on foreign aid in order to be able to provide at least the most minimum of subsistence to ensure that people could you know, at least stay alive to continue to go down and work, uh, whether it be in the mines or, or, or elsewhere for, um, for transnational capital. Finally, the ever-decreasing concentration of decision-making among elites. And this would have an impact not just in the sense of the, the pretty much the uh, um, tighter concentration in, you know, within smaller and smaller political elites of who got to decide, but we also saw during the period of the 80s and 90s the complete or, or the almost complete disappearance of what had traditionally been the two largest forces on the broad left um, in Latin America, and that is nationalist um, uh, parties, for instance, movement of the National Revolution in Bolivia, and the Peronist movement uh, in Argentina, and also social democratic forces, who by the time of the 80s and 90s were implementing the exact same project of the right wing, and that was neoliberalism. In fact, you can look at country after country. In Bolivia, for instance, it was the same party that led the National Revolution of 52, which in 1985 was carrying out the privatisation of those very mines that they had nationalised um, and resulting in what I've pointed out here. So what does this situation create? Well, it creates a very large crisis in these societies. A political crisis, a crisis within the political class, a crisis of the state, and a beginning of a rebellion from below. Many of these new governments that would become elected were, of course, preceded by an important wave of mobilisations and rebellions. And one thing that a number, and particularly the more radical uh, projects, uh, had in common was two things. The first was the need to use the Constituent Assembly as a weapon of struggle, and that is to change the, the balance of forces in the political sphere. And also a real understanding that independence or liberation could only come via a unified movement of, of Latin America, Bolivarianism, uh, in reference to Simon Bolivar, who one of the leaders of the first uh, struggle for independence uh, in the, in the 19th century. But that's easy to put in some broad terms, but sometimes I think to really understand um, what the processes mean today for the people of, of Bolivia, Venezuela, what it means for ordinary people, is to try to capture the essence of why it is that people decided to move into action. Because, you know, people, you generally don't move into action because they read the Communist Manifesto and they've decided socialism is what they want. Generally, it's much more simpler things. Um, and I think there's two quotes, uh, there are many quotes, but two quotes from uh, Felipe Quispe, an admired indigenous leader that I think, at least for Bolivian context, but more broadly captured or is the essence of what has been driving this revolt from below in Latin America. And the first was when he was uh, arrested for being part of a, a terrorist cell, a guerrilla group, 
in, in the mid-90s, uh, one that he formed together with the current Bolivian Vice President, uh, Alvaro Garcia Linera. Uh, he was asked by Amalia Pando, uh, well-known uh, Bolivian journalist, uh, very um, known for being quite a critical voice in the media, so she's got a lot of support, particularly amongst sort of intellectual, um, sort of more uh, white urban uh, middle class uh, sort of sectors that have been discontented with neoliberalism. When she asked Kispe, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you setting up this guerrilla group? His simple response was so that one day my, my daughter doesn't have to clean your house for you, doesn't have to be your domestic worker. He also made it clear in another, another talk that he said is that, look, we don't fit your, your cultural stereotypes. We are postmodern indigenous people. We want land, but we want tractors and internet as well. That was a real sense of what was driving this, this revolt from below, that we are fed up with what has been occurring with us. Um, we're fed up with the fact that we've seen no future for our children, and we want something different. Um, but what we want in some cases is very basic stuff, um, not, not what you know, some uh, cultural elites in, in the academia world might think we want. What was the proposal for change? What if we, if we go beyond uh, the discourse, what was at the heart of this process of change? We need political change. That was reflected in the demand constituent assembly now. The current political system does not work for us. We need a new setup. And the way that w this would be done would be for a constituent assembly that would involve and include all sectors of society and to be able to discuss and debate the new framework uh, in which the countries would be run. Secondly, that this would only be possible if natural resources came back into the hands of the people via the state. That, that wealth had to stop being leached out of the country, had to stay within the country in order to meet the needs of the people. By doing those two things, by refounding the state and ensuring that the wealth stayed within the country, finally we could have a homeland for all. One where everyone was welcome, one where everyone was able to have their fair share um, of that wealth. Just doing this very simple thing, or what would seemingly be a simple thing, thing that probably most people would agree, provoked a reaction of very powerful forces. I think many times in reference to Venezuela, people used the quote of Leon Trotsky about and the revolution sometimes needs the whip of counter-revolution. Well, I think this, this quote from Lenin, for me, very much encapsulates a lot of what's been happening in Latin America. And that is with every small attempt to try to implement this basic idea of the people, they have been increasingly met with the resistance of bigger and bigger enemies. And that in large part has been driving uh, the further deepening of, of some of these processes and the more intensification of the class struggle. Uh, there. All right, so I think that, that, that then brings me to the end of the, the summary bit. I'm pretty sure the next slide <coughs> brings us back to those three issues that I mentioned at the start. Who is the revolutionary subject? Well, of course, the traditional answer, certainly the one that socialist or Marxists give, is the working class, and that, that's the answer. <laughs> you know, uh, we, we can leave it at there. Today, that's not necessarily the answer that most people would give in, in Latin America. Um, for some, it would be it's the urban poor or urban poor communities um, that are surrounding the big, uh, big areas according to things like uh, the city of El Alto uh, in Bolivia, where the majority, overwhelming majority are in the informal sector, um, the barrios, the shanty towns in, in Caracas, um, but in other countries as well. Others that are now starting to doubt whether it's these communities, um, now that they see that many of these communities are demanding things like water, electricity, basic services, and in order for the government to provide it, they need to continue to extract uh, hydrocarbons in order to be able to fund the state coffers and provide these basic services. Others, other sections now decide it's the indigenous groups out in the countryside, the ones that are wanting to fight against gas and oil extraction. They're the real revolutionary subjects. They're the ones that are not tampered by this consumerism that has invaded um, the urban poor who want to now enrich themselves uh, through some of these processes. Others continue to argue it's just the traditional industrial workers. Um, they're very hard to find nowadays in Latin America, but they're not very hard to find people that will argue that it's the industrial workers that are the working class. And so therefore, when for instance in recent weeks, Bolivian miners have been coming out from the streets to demand that their pensions be increased at the expense of informal worker pensions who get taken away from them uh, in order to fund these increases, this is seen as the struggle of militant workers um, against the state as opposed to are trying to understand the broader complexities of what is the working class um, in Latin America and certainly in Bolivia. Well, how can we begin to discuss this question of working class? One is there's no doubt that there are more working class people in Latin America and internationally than ever before. And yet at the same time, there's so little working class organisation. I think therefore it's important to reconsider or rethink Marx's idea or the conception of what is a class in itself and a class for itself. It's also important to answer in the negative, what doesn't make the working class revolutionary? Firstly, it's not because they're inherently revolutionary. Uh, if they were, then we probably wouldn't need to be having this discussion today. 
the revolution would have already have happened. But secondly, nor is it just because they go and work in a factory. Uh, that was certainly not anything that Marx ever argued about what made the working class have at least a potential, uh, a revolutionary potential. Instead, we should try and go back and try to understand, well, what is the working class in the broader framework of the way that Marx understood it? So he said it's not just a question, firstly, of your relations in production. So it's not just those that work in the factory to produce something that are just workers. But it also has to do with the, your relations to production. And more specifically, who controls the appropriation of the surplus product in that, in that society? So here are some pointers that we could look to. Of course, those that do sell their labour power are workers. No one's denying that. What is true, though, in many cases is that as a process of the neoliberal restructuring in Latin America, is that those that do that in a formal setting have become an increasingly smaller percentage of the working class and have increasingly become a much higher relative privilege uh, compared to the rest of the working class. And so it's no surprise that you'll find that in Bolivia, again, to use the example, uh, many of the miners in Huanuni are earning higher than the than the presidential um, wage, uh, particularly in the context of the mining boom. Uh, so we're talking in, in the vicinity of you know, $10,000 a month, $15,000 a month, some even higher than that. Uh, many, many in the informal sector would be struggling to earn that in a year. But that doesn't make them not working class either. Those that are unable to sell their labour power, again, would be defined as part of being this revolutionary subject of the working class. But what about those that operate in the sphere of circulation, particularly those that are forced to take on the burden of all, those, of all their costs, those that are indebted, um, whether it be directly to uh, capitalists who figure out that it's easier to, make their, to sell their commodities in the informal sector, but force those in the informal sector to take on the, the burden of the cost. So if they sell it, they make some money. If they don't, then they're the ones that lose out. Street vendors, informal workers. Again, I would say that they come, and certainly part of the discussion in Latin America, would be classified as part of these of the working class. And also those that help the reproduction of labour. Teachers, and, and there was actually another one there, but also you know, women that are doing housework as well. Um, the important role that they play in ensuring the reproduction um, of, of labour power, I think means that they should be considered as part of, of the working class. So that gives us an idea, perhaps a, a framework of who can make up the working class, but it still hasn't resolved this issue of the difference between a class in itself and for itself. We can you know, redefine the boundaries of working class to come up with what I heard in the discussion, Paul, Paul LeBlanc mentioned uh, the immense majority or the great majority of society. Well, certainly in that, you know, if we define it solely as industrial workers and they're far from being the immense majority in any of the Latin American countries, but if we use the broader definition that I, I tried to refer to here, we start to see that they are the large majority. But it still doesn't get us to the point of well, how did this working class become a class for itself. And I think it's about understanding that working class struggle doesn't just happen in the factories. It's not just a question of industrial struggle. We also have the question of that all of these struggles, whether it be for wages, housing, against sexism, are part of this struggle for human development, but are also struggles that pit workers against capital, be that in the form of the boss, be that in the form of the landlord. And Marx understood that it was only through these struggles that workers are transformed and become a revolutionary subject. I think that's what we've seen in Latin America, where these immense majorities have, for all these various struggles, come together to become to raise an alternate project, one that I surmised earlier in this basic idea of refound the state, recuperate our wealth in order to create a homeland for all. Well, that's just a quote from Marx where he sort of refers to this. Separate individuals form a class only in so far as they have to carry out a common battle against another class. Otherwise, they're on hostile terms with each other as competitors. Now, he puts it pretty crudely, but I think there's, there's an element of truth to, to what he's saying there. That's revolutionary subject. Yes, it's the working class, but it's the real working class, not those that we read about in textbooks um, that are the ones that are making this, this process. And of course, they bring with them their own demands, their own issues. Uh, and a very good example of that, of the contradictions that this new working class reflects is the, the very much the city of El Alto, the one that I mentioned before with a large amount of informal workers. Reflected both in the fact that um, twice when I've been there, uh, two of the major protests that have been organised by those working in the formal sector of El Alto, which are a small amount but an, not unimportant <laughs> amount, uh, whose main demand was to ensure that the government maintained its uh, preferential trade pact with the US government. Uh, one that would see preferential trade in regards to textiles in return for Bolivian cooperation uh, with uh, the drug war. Um, this was seen by the workers as the way to ensure that they could maintain their livelihoods. Of course, the government said this was re a renouncing of our sovereignty um, in order to do so. Um, at the same time, for the overwhelming majority of the informal workers, one of their key demands has nothing to do with free trade, uh, but rather is for their ability for their children to be able to learn Chinese or Mandarin 
in schools because of the huge amount of trade that now occurring uh, between China and where many of the commodities that are being sold in the informal sector are coming from. Um, so they've been able to have that second language, not the indigenous language, but Chinese language uh, is seen as a very important one and one that has been, um, been demanded of uh, in the government to introduce into the curriculum. But then we come to the question of well, what about this issue of power? Um, should we take power? How do we take power? And on one level, a lot of times it's been posed as a, as a simple contradiction, uh, elections versus insurrection, uh, reform versus revolution. But of course, it's never really been like that. No one's ever sort of said reformists are only for reforms and revolutions are only, revolutionaries are only for revolutions. Um, neither have you know, ever, you know, I think revolutionaries argued that we're only for insurrection and we're, we're against elections full stop. Um, these are not the, the ways and certainly not the way that these debates have been played out um, in Latin America. Instead, it's been quite the opposite. The real sense that taking governmental power was seen as an important part, but only as an initial step towards taking state power, which means understanding that government and the state are not the same thing. But it also means having to deal with the question that for most people, particularly in a society where you have um, regular democratic elections, for most people the time of elections, um, quite the question of power is posed. And that is where many of these different sectors have begun to organise themselves. In the Cocalero group in Bolivia, uh, what, was their, how, what was their thinking? Firstly was to oppose the US drug war. This meant confrontation with the US military and the Bolivian military. Uh, they were unable to win. So what did they decide? Well look, if the parliamentarians won't change the law to get them out there, then we've got to get in there to change the laws so that we can have it our way. And from there, they would grow on to become a you know, key force in this broader alliance that is emerging in, in Bolivia as part of the process of change. Um, but for them, they understood that questions wasn't just about a reform though. Um, it was about as a first step to, to really change in Bolivia. So if you want to put it in, in, in modern terms, it's about occupying governmental power, trying to use governmental power to change the balance of forces in favour of those fighting for change. But in some ways, what they've also discovered is that winning governmental power or the elections is, in, is, is kind of the easy bit. The harder, harder work comes after that. Uh, and that's overcoming two big challenges. And this is you know, mainly in the context of struggles like those in Venezuela and Bolivia, uh, where there's a real attempt to go beyond um, capitalism or very minimum, you know, well beyond neoliberalism. And that is dealing with the inherited state bureaucracy and the role that that state bureaucracy continues to play in undermining uh, the process of change. But also how do you expand and deepen mobilisation and organisation from below as part of building this new state? And of course this is a question that very much uh, is being worked out in practice, but also in a situation, and well, uh, a never before seen situation. You know, consider this in Venezuela. If we take as the starting point of the Venezuelan revolution, not Chavez's election, but the period of 2002, 2003, uh, with the defeat of the military coup, the defeat of the boss's lockout in the oil sector, and the sort of rejuvenated power uh, that came out of that. And that was in 2003, 10 years ago. Uh, the Bolshevik revolution, 10 years after 1917, well, we kind of most, most of us know where that was. Um, by that stage in regards to popular power from below. Um, yet in Venezuela they're trying to deal with not just how do you do this, but how do you continue to mobilise and keep an active population uh, mm -hmm. engaged in it? Uh, how do you deal with when the people you know, decide that we've, we've won, now it's time for the government or someone else uh, to resolve our problems. We did our bit, we overthrew the old elites and put you in there, now, now it's time for you to do, the, do with the change that we want. That has brought with it these ideas raised by Garcia Linero of creative tensions. He refers to four, but he says that many more may, come, may open up as part of this process of change. How do you deal with the relationship between a state, which is understood as the monopoly of decision making, of political power, a state has a monopoly over it, and social movements, so the state that has a monopoly and has to act in social movements whose general practice is to uh, deliberate, discuss, try and reach consensus, um, which can be a long and slow process in many cases. How do you deal with that, with that contradiction, that tension? How do you continue to involve the broader sections of society while ensuring that you maintain working class hegemony or as an important nuclei um, of this process of change? So how do you uh, deal with um, sections of business uh, that are willing to, to support the process, but obviously only to a limited extent, ensure that you don't allow that their influence to become the dominant uh, in this process. How do you defend the general interests of society against those of particular segments? And that might mean even different segments of the working class themselves. You know, how do you deal with um, situations where both sides have legitimate grievances, and both sides have le legitimate issues, 
Uh, but you, they're not like the old conflicts where it was clear uh, on the one side were the gas transnationals and the other side were the people who wanted to recuperate the gas for the, for the country. Now it's a question of uh, we want my municipality to get that gas wealth over the other municipality. In fact, one of the biggest conflicts that have been occurring in Bolivia is the attempts to um, redraw municipal boundaries because a lot of the gas wealth uh, goes through um, a direct tax to municipalities. So by redrawing the boundaries and part of the new census, you get more people in your municipality, so you get more gas funding. So there's literally been a military that have been called in into border areas to stop these, these um, fights. And these are not uh, class battles between uh, capitalists and, and, and workers. Uh, these are different segments that are trying to, um, that are in conflict, and how do you deal with those tensions? And lastly, how do you deal with the need to industrialise, develop the economy whilst protecting the environment? This has become obviously a big issue, certainly in Bolivia, one that's caught a lot of the media attention. What kind of organisation do we need? For me, this sort of kind of sums up. A lot of times we say we need an organisation with the right ideas, but having the right ideas alone is not enough to do politics. Actually, you need a force to make those ideas a reality. Alfredo Monero, Venezuelan revolutionary from the 70s, he said that politics has to be understood as both having reason, having the right ideas, but also having the force to make those implemented. One without the other, and it works both ways, um, is not a revolutionary politics. Um, so having ideas, but having no interest in trying to accumulate the forces to make that a reality, just leaves you in a nice little room talking to yourself. A constant pursuit of just force for the sake of force, but without any politics, will lead you anywhere but towards um, a revolutionary politics. So a few pointers from the discussions that we've had, different people from the left in Latin America, we're trying to grapple with, with this political organisation question and it's kind of interesting that actually when a lot of times there's discussion about broad left, narrow left, uh, big left, small left, revolutionary left, non-revolutionary left, um, very little is said of the Latin American left uh, despite all of its experiences. Um, what, is, what has been the success or otherwise of uh, revolutionary uh, uh, left parties uh, in, in Latin America? Uh, and I think that actually the, the, the story to now has been that and those that are the self-identified revolutionary groups have unfortunately played a, a very little to, to, to no role um, in a lot of these struggles. But that doesn't mean that revolutionary socialists and Marxists haven't uh, in many of the cases that have been playing important roles. But those small parties have, un, un, you know, very few of any have played a, a major role in what has been occurring now for two decades in Latin America. So what kind of organisation do we need? Well, firstly, the party has to be seen not as the ends in itself, but really a means, and that is the party has to be an instrument in the hands of the, of the working class people, an instrument in order to, to advance the struggle of the working class. I think that's an important first element. It has to be able to raise an alternative project for the country, one that is able to bring together um, the working class forces from across the country. It has to be able to organise the real leaders, the real militants in the struggle to be able to discuss and debate the tactics and strategies forward. And in order to do that, in order to be able to deal the most decisive blows possible against capital. And I also believe that it has to be pluralist in its vision of socialism. And I think that's for two reasons. One, I think we've kind of, you know, I think surely from 20th century socialism we've learnt the, the problems of thinking that there is one idea of socialism and what that has entailed. Um, but also in the context of everything that the left has gone through in the last two decades, the defeats, the rollbacks, the idea that despite all that somehow the germ of or the, the, the seed of that socialist idea remains in just one group somewhere, uh, I think you know, can be relatively you know, brushed aside. Um, that actually there are elements of that socialist project that are dispersed and that need to be regrouped once again uh, into these organisations. So to finish off, I worked with Marta Hardica in, in Latin America, in Venezuela, particularly on the issue of, of building left parties. An article that she wrote well, I thought was a good summary for me of the kind of political organisation we need. The vision I have of this political instrument is one of an organisation capable of raising a national project, so and I've got the national project a bit involved, that can bring together all those sectors affected by the crisis and act as a compass for them. An organisation that directs its efforts towards society, um, as opposed to institutions or the, or the government, respecting the autonomy of social movements, that refuses to manipulate them and whose members and leaders are true popular educators, capable of unleashing the wisdom that exists amongst the people both that which comes from their cultural traditions and struggles, as well as that which they acquire for everyday life, through the fusion of this knowledge with the global ideas that the political organisation can contribute. We have to overcome the old and deeply rooted error of attempting to build political force without building social force. Um, I think in that, in that short paragraph, 
encapsulate some of those points um, that I outlined before and I think it very much reflects a kind of a discussion debate about how to build that political organisation. Uh, how that's been done in reality in Latin America and the challenges that that's been faced is a difficult one but I think this sort of sums up in some ways um, much of that discussion that, is, that has been occurring there. <laughs>